welcome back. I'm gonna wait a couple minutes for people to join. Yeah, we're gonna be talking about this little guy right here, Brant's Cormorant's Pellets, <laughs> Bark Falls. All right. Oh, hi, Marissa. Let's see who else is joining. Just gonna oh, give Meredith's here. Hi Meredith. Hello. Yeah, I'm just gonna give some people some more time to show up. Yeah, and we'll get started in just a minute. Fresh. Thanks for joining in everyone. Our monthly live. Yeah. Alright, so. we'll get started in just a minute here. Yeah, so thanks for joining everybody. Oh, it looks like Quinn's here. Hi, Sarah. Sarah's here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Hi, Lishka. Our usual viewers. <laughs> thanks. Our loyal viewers. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining. All right. Shall we? Yeah, let's get started. Let's do it. All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Point Blue Marine Lab. I'm Olivia. I'm Rebecca. So I started here back in September of last year after I graduated from Cal State Monterey Bay with a degree in molecular biology. Um, here I researched uh, how to fix problems with taking marine pH. Um, but since then I've been here in the marine lab and have changed my focus to more of the biological. Um, so I hope to continue that uh, by getting a graduate degree at um, Oregon State University for fishery science. Yeah, and I started here in January of this year, and I will be here until the end of spring of next year. I graduated from Humboldt State University in May 2019, and I've had various positions working with seabirds, those are my favorite, um, and so I hope to continue that and obtain a position as a wildlife biologist in the future, studying the health of our ocean and its inhabitants. So also my next step is graduate school, hopefully at Oregon State University. We're following each other <laughs> um, in the next year or two. Yeah, so unfortunately due to technical difficulties, we won't be having Meredith try to hop on with video, but um, she is our lab manager and she'll be answering questions in the comments. So keep an eye out for her answers. <laughs> yeah, and then yeah, so Rebecca and I have been following all the COVID guidelines and we live together, um, so therefore we are considered a family unit and um, that's why we can work in the lab without wearing masks. Um, and the lab is also separate from the main office here in Petaluma, which is still closed to the public, unfortunately, but we are looking forward to when we can have visitors again. So yeah, we would like to attribute this live stream to a volunteer who recently passed away. Um, her name is Chris Durham. She volunteered in the lab for about 10 years. Sorting through Brant's Cormorant's pellets was one of the first projects she helped us with and she enjoyed it so much. Each pellet was a little gift and she relished the fact that she never knew what she was going to find. Uh, Chris helped us with many of our lab projects and she also helped out Point Blue's administration with special events. She was a real gem and we'll miss her. So thank you Meredith for those kind words. Yeah, keep an eye out for a picture Meredith's going to post in the comments about that. So yeah, welcome back uh, to our third live stream. If you missed our other live streams, you can still view them on Point Blue's Facebook page. Um, and yeah, with that we'll get started. And so today uh, we're going to be looking at the diets of Brant's cormorants. So these are birds on the Farallon Islands that Point Blue studies. Um, and yeah, so we'll be looking at the diets and that, um, sorry. <laughs> so in the marine lab, we study the diets of many marine predators, um, like today's seabird. And this is a continuation of key data sets on the Farallon Islands. Um, we have Point Blue biologists stationed out there, and so they will collect these pellets for us. Another study that we look at um, are zooplankton communities with our access cruises. Um, and by getting a sense of these prey communities and uh, these zooplankton communities, we can get a better sense of the health of our ocean. And since we have these long-term data sets, we can track these changes over time. Um, yeah, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Rebecca to talk about the marine predator that swims. Yeah, so today we'll be talking about the Brant's cormorant. 
This is a seabird that lives on the Pacific coast. It ranges from Alaska down to Mexico. And we focus on four populations here in the lab in California. But the main one that we get a lot of our samples from are the Farallon Islands. They're about 30 miles off of the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco Bay. So cormorants are strictly marine birds. They're rarely found inland. Um, they like to hang out on rocky islands, cliff sides, and coastlines. And many of you have probably seen a cormorant in your life. They're hard to miss. This is what they look like. They're very dark, slender bodies, um, cute birds. <laughs> but you may have seen them in this formation, perched, drying out their feathers. And you may wonder, why are they drying out their feathers? They're seabirds. Well, <laughs> actually, unlike other seabirds that have that waterproofing feather mechanism, cormorants have evolved with feathers that are easily waterlogged. So this prevents air bubbles from being trapped underneath, allowing them to dive super deep for their food. Fun fact. <laughs> So um, the largest populations of Brant's cormorants exist in Northern California and Washington, and this is where upwelling is the strongest um, from the California current. And these nutrient-rich waters support a high quantity of this bird's preferred prey. And um, so they capitalize on fish, they love their fish, um, such as northern anchovy, rockfish, and sand dabs, just to name a few. Um, but they will also forage for cephalopods, which are squid and octopus. So they sometimes we sometimes see that in our sample. Um, but fish is their preferred prey. So how do they catch these fish? They are pursuit divers. They can dive up to 230 feet, which is really deep for a seabird. They're up there with the emperor penguin for deepest dives. Um, so yeah, they visually hunt for their food, their fish, or cephalopods. Um, underwater, they capture it with their beak and crush it and eat it head first. They're pretty ferocious birds. Um, so yeah, and whatever cannot be fully digested gets packed into a little pellet and thrown up daily um, at breeding colonies or just on land. And um, wildlife biologists that are at these breeding colonies actually pick up those pellets and bring them to us here at the marine lab because there are certain things with, within those pellets that can tell us exactly what fish or um, octopus or squid that these birds are eating. And Olivia will get more into that process after I talk about these birds. Um, so yeah, unfortunately, Brant's cormorant populations appear to be in decline. This is due to disturbances at colonies from um, humans, boaters, uh, dogs, other seabirds like western gulls. They are very territorial at these breeding colonies. Um, so this can lead into just low productivity rates, broken eggs, or permanent abandonment at those colonies. And because these birds are always out there on the ocean, they do come in contact with oil spills and marine pollution. So that is... Sorry, there might be some technical Wi-Fi issues. Is that better? Can you see us now? Okay, I think we're back on. Sorry about that. It's a little fuzzy. Okay, it's clearing up. Okay. Can you see <laughs> us now? Okay. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you, Quinn. <laughs> um, so yeah, um, changes in the physical marine environment could be causing prey availability to switch and shift, which could in turn um, cause low productivity rates. So here at the Marine Lab, we study the diet of these birds to understand that relationship between these prey communities and Brant's cormorant productivity rates. 
because like Olivia mentioned, we have really long-term data sets where we can look back and see what prey was dominant in one year and how it related to breeding productivity and um, how it fluctuates throughout the years and um, overall see how those prey communities are doing, the health of our ocean, and relate it to the breeding success of these birds, which is very important since their populations appear to be in decline. So with that, I will turn it over to Olivia to talk about those barf balls yeah. and what we do with them here yeah. at the lab. <laughs> yeah, so last live stream we talked about the least turn and how we study their diets with uh, looking through their feces for scales. Um, but today, like Rebecca mentioned, we're going to be looking at the pellets. So this is what they look like. They come to us in these bags um, where biologists on the islands will come and package them and then we have them frozen until they're ready to be analyzed. And that's what we're going to show you guys today. Um, so yeah, kind of the first steps are to put it in some soapy water to rehydrate the mucus and kind of remove some of the dirt. So yeah, if you're squeamish, just be aware this is bird barf. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of gross, but <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Um, because looking at these, we can determine the species of fish or cephalopods like Rebecca mentioned. So some things we'll be looking for are otoliths. So these are fish ear bones. They're found in the heads of fish and they help the fish orient itself in the water column and each fish has a pair of these otoliths that are mirror images of each other. So using that, we can determine how many fish this bird ate because we can kind of pair up these otoliths that we call siding. Um, we'll show you later how we side these otoliths. Um, but yeah, so we can determine the species by looking for certain characteristics on the otoliths. So some of them have like this nose part called a rostrum. Um, they usually have a sulcus, and some are deeper or different shaped uh, than other fish. Uh, we also look at kind of the overall shape of the otolith, what it looks like, um, and then the thickness too is kind of important. So um, some otoliths are thicker than others, and we can use that to help us ID them. Yeah, and like Rebecca mentioned, they also eat cephalopods, so we'll be looking for their beaks today. Obviously these are way bigger than the ones we'll be finding. Um, but these are the mouth parts of squid and octopus, and so these can't be digested, so they're usually found in the pellets as well. Um, so this is what they look like. They have an upper beak and a lower beak. Um, by using this, we can count the upper and lower beaks to see how many cephalopods they ate. And then to determine the species, we look at kind of the length of this part here, um, the overall shape of the beak and also the coloration can differ between uh, species. And some species we normally find are California two-spot octopus and also market squid. Um, yeah, and then so some other things we might be finding in this palette today are fish eye lenses, which are little round bead-looking things. Um, those are actually yeah, the eye lenses of fish. Um, so we'll be pointing those out. And then also vertebrae, um, sometimes parasites, these birds can have parasites, so if you're squeamish, again, <laughs> we might be finding some of those. And then also we sometimes find isopods, which kind of look like uh, roly-polies, and they're usually the parasites found on the fish, not really in the bird, um, but those are indigestible, so those will sometimes be found in our pellets. So we don't know what we're going to find today, but we will be showing you that in a minute. But yeah, so all this data we collect uh, and record. Um, we'll measure the otoliths and that can give us a general size of the fish it came from. So this is about the size of fish that these birds are eating. Um, and yeah, we have like an algorithm that we can estimate the size of the fish based on the size of the otolith we find. Um, and then also, yeah, we'll, we'll count the number uh, that we find so we can get a total count. Like Rebecca said, they make a pellet like every day so we can see how many fish they're eating in a day, um, also the species that are available to them. And so all this data goes into that long-term data set that we mentioned. And by doing this, we can track you know, what fish are good for their diets, um, what fish maybe they, they need for uh, better productivity. Um, so yeah. And we'll have you guys guess how many otoliths are like the most amount of otoliths we found in a single pellet. So. Um, think about that as we go through this pellet. Yeah. But yeah, with that, I guess we'll start our pellet dissection. 
yeah, and if you guys have any questions, feel free to leave them in the chat box. We will be monitoring that. And then also Meredith is there to answer any questions that we don't get to. And um, we have a donate link. Hopefully you guys can see that. Uh, Point Blue relies on donations to um, continue this work and to continue conservation work and for our ocean to stay as healthy as they can be. <laughs> So yeah, here we go. We're going to show you some bird bars. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So as Olivia showed, they come to us in these little whirl packs, all dried. And so we open them up. and we put it into a little cup with the sample number, the species, the date collected, know. and but where. Interrupted. Okay. So I'm gonna put some soapy soap inside. Going through. It'll keep going. Yeah, I'll just keep going. And then pop it into here. And then we like to put water in this bag just in case there's any otoliths left behind. And then put it into the cup. Like that. Put some more water. <laughs> so it's all soapy. And then usually we'll do this first thing in the morning so it can have some time to thaw out and really break up that mucus and dirt that Olivia was talking about. So we just let it sit. We prepped one this morning for you guys. Um, see how it's kind of, yeah. <laughs> the mucus is rehydrated and it's ready to go. So then we put it in this fine mesh sieve so we can clean it even more. Get all those leftovers. And then rinsey rinse. Get all that soap out. Any dirt that is on there. There she is in all her glory. <laughs> Put her in the dish. Use some more water to get all those remnants. Double check. Yeah. And she's ready. Wow. You can already see some otoliths in there, those white things. Yeah. So this is gonna be a good pellet. Get that sample. And then I'm gonna transfer this over to the microscope. Bird barf up close. Yeah. Let's see if we have some questions. Yeah, when were these samples collected? Yeah, these were collected in September. September 10th, to be yeah. exact. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Yeah. You guys see okay? Here we are. <laughs> yeah, you can already see an eye lens there. Oh, there's an Odie. So yeah, these pellets are, <clears throat> they range in size, but they're usually pretty big. Um, have some rocks in there, <laughs> all that good stuff. So we're gonna dive on in. This looks like a good pocket. Ooh, yeah, good one. It's definitely like a gift. <laughs> You're just opening up a present of fish parts. Yeah, look at those odies. I see some. Sand dabs. Sand dabs. Oh, geez. <laughs> Sand dabs are actually not the best fish for them. <laughs> but they eat a lot. It's good. Yeah. Yeah, look at those. And these um, balls here, those are actually fish eye lenses. 
They're really hard and um, they look like beads, very circular. I actually did a project on plastic ingestion in seabirds at Humboldt and I was finding so many of these in seabird guts way smaller than this and I thought they were micro beads <laughs> for the longest time and it would took a long time for me to figure out that they were eye lenses and now I see them every day <laughs> so funny story so yeah this one has a lot of otoliths yeah and different kinds too so you guys yeah. can see the shape Let's... there's some thinner ones and then there's some rounder ones mm -hmm. let me ch <laughs> it's really hard to do this <laughs> So yeah, there's one with that rostrum that Olivia was talking about. Yeah. Looks like these are gonna be um, some anchovy. Mm -hmm. Looks like pad thai. That's funny. Oh, who said that? Uh, Glad. Okay, so Glad you good think question, so. Marissa. Why are sand dabs not good for them to eat? Mm. So yeah, so think about where sand dabs live. So these are flatfish, and they live on the bottom of the ocean. They usually have the sandy bottom. That's where they like to live. And these birds live on a rocky island. So mm -hmm. for them to get these sand dabs, they have to fly all the way back to where the fish are located. And then they're also, since they live on the bottom, the, fish, or the bird has to dive down to eat a sand dab and then mm -hmm. come back up to the surface and do that over again. So that's a lot of energy mm -hmm. this bird is going to be expending uh, to get these fish. Whereas um, something like anchovy are located kind of at the surface and they're closer to the island. Uh, and they're usually fattier. So usually if we see anchovy, it's going to be a better year for the chicks. Mm -hmm. um, and sand dabs are usually uh, indicative that there's not as many um, anchovy are on the island. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, there's an, this is a northern anchovy otolith. Right here. Focus. Yes, yeah. right here. And then right here is <laughs> the one and only sand dab. Sand dabs. These look like big sand dab otoliths. Yeah, so at least they're big fish. Mm -hmm. Um, got those eye lenses here. Um, yeah. Not a lot of parasites, which yeah. is good. Sometimes it's not the best thing to find. Um, doesn't necessarily mean that the bird is really sick. They're just, you know, out there in nature. <laughs> they come in contact with some gross things. Yeah. So Veronica asked, uh, can you tell what kind of fish the lenses came from? Unfortunately, no. <laughs> um, but because fish have two eyes, we can kind of get a count. Um, we don't really rely on eye lenses for anything in our data. We do count them. Or, no, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we don't count them. Um, but, I mean, you could technically kind of see how many fish. Mm -hmm. But otoliths are a way better way to mm -hmm. count how many fish this bird ate and actually identify the species. Yeah. Yeah, some other things that might be in there are maybe some vertebrae or other fish bones. Um, and then kind of the orange stuff is generally mucus and, yeah, that kind of protects the stomach of the bird, I think, um, from these hard parts. Doesn't look like we're seeing any beaks. Mm -mm. Rock. Ooh. Got some feathers. Yeah. Yeah, so we will actually pick out each one of these otoliths and place them in a slide, which I guess we will show you now. An example of a finished sample. So, can anyone guess what these are, <laughs> if you were paying attention? These are very good for them to eat. They love this fish. Um, 
So yeah, this is the slide that we place all of these otoliths in. Wow, good job, mm -hmm. Quinn. Yeah, these are anchovy <laughs> and <Yeah>. lishka. <laughs> That's this fish. Oh! <laughs> He's probably about the size that they're eating. Yeah. Um, yeah, and some, some ways that I find helpful to identify um, anchovy is that they are pretty thin otoliths. Um, I don't know if you can see thickness on here. They're pretty thin. Um, sometimes they have this bump on the back that we can look for, but otherwise they're smooth. Other ones might be uh, lumpier, mm -hmm. and then also kind of this rostrum. They're very slender otoliths, like this way. Um, and then this sulcus here, it's kind of hard to see because these are pretty digested, um, but it's kind of wider there, and then it kind of goes up towards the back. Um, and then also the general shape, kind of the back end, I look for kind of this swooping down motion there. Um, and mm -hmm. that's it's usually pretty easy to identify them unless they're like super eroded. Yeah, or that not rostrum could be broken off and mm -hmm. then you just have the end part. Yeah. Yeah, they're not usually this perfect yeah. <laughs> not all the time. Yeah, sometimes they're pretty broken up, like these are just broken ones. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I guess we can pull out a few to sigh. Yeah. So these... I think I've already cited, but I'm full See, so yeah, like Olivia mentioned earlier, they're mirror images <clears throat> of each other, and fish have two, two ears, two ear bones. <laughs> so we can, by citing them left and right, we can get a count of how many fish, no, technically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so these, so we'll kind of point them where the rostrum's pointing. So we'll call this one a left otolith. And then we always want the sulcus facing up and that's how we can side them. And then this one, it's kind of hard to tell the sulcus, but it's facing up. And so you can see their, the rostrum over here because kind of the sulcus widens towards the end where the rostrum is, that nosy part. Uh, we can see but these are in fact mere images. So with this count of say two, uh, we can assume this came from one fish. Mm -hmm. So we can say this bird ate one anchovy at least. Mm -hmm. And then we also measure it using our microscope. You can kind of see that ruler there, it's a little lopsided, but yeah, yeah we measure these otoliths yeah. and we have a way of knowing how big the fish is based on the size of these otoliths. So we can show you some fun ones. Yeah, we'll show you some other ones behind. <laughs> so we'll start with Rebecca's favorite. Yeah. <laughs> These are plain men fit midshipmen. <laughs> plain fin, fin. Plain fin midshipmen. It's a mouthful. They almost look like teeth. They're really cool. Yeah. I just really like <clears throat> the shape. They're very glossy. Okay, Quinn says, I assume fish have two otoliths per individual. Does that mean you can count the otoliths here we go, um, and divide them by two to get a fish count? Or is there a possibility that only one otolith will be found in a given pellet? If so, could that skew the fish count? Yeah, you're right, Quinn. <laughs> Good observation. Yeah, so I think, <clears throat> yeah, Meredith answered here. But yeah, usually, um, there, not every single otolith is going to be found in the pellet. Um, and so instead of getting the number and dividing it by two, like that makes sense, but um, if you were to actually side them, you can say, oh, there was five left otoliths and three right, which would be, you would assume there's five total because there is five otoliths, or five left otoliths. But mm -hmm. if you took that number and divided it by two, <laughs> you would have one less fish, if that makes sense. Yeah. Because um, sometimes we'll find... You know, say 10 more lefts than rights and so um, if we just took that number in half that would only add five to the count instead of ten if that makes sense <laughs> yeah so what's your favorite otolith olivia uh, my favorite is the, 
We don't have an example, but the California tongue fish <laughs> is my favorite because it kind of reminds me of the fish. It's very featureless and round. <laughs> but this is my second favorite, probably. Um, this is a um, cusk eel otolith. Mm -hmm. Those are really thick. So yeah, you can see how <laughs> thick these ones are. They're super thick. Yeah, and there's not much of a sulcus. You can kind of see in the shiny part um, that there's like a little sulcus, but it's definitely not as deep as some of the other ones we'll be showing you. Yeah, this is a cusk eel. My yeah, fave. those are really fun to find. They're fun. They're super they're so thick. Good. Yeah. <laughs> they're usually always intact. Too, yeah. So we like that. <laughs> Let's see. What other ones do we got? These are rockfish. Oh yes, another so. popular one. Mm -hmm. These are fairly good for them, nutritious wise. Yeah, and kind of like, I know Marissa asked a question how you can tell rockfish apart by their otoliths. It's really hard. Um, we just call them rockfish spa, but you can see here that they're like a little curved and then they also are lumpier, kind of, and that's how we can tell them apart from the other otoliths, but usually rockfish otoliths kind of tend to look the same, so we group them all in that family. But yeah, so yeah. these are, this is like how we would side them. These probably came from the same fish. Yeah, and yeah. as we're showing you all these, now that you have an idea of the size and what they look like, remember, our guessing game, how many do you think we've found in a single pellet? Multiple species, just how many otoliths in general? <laughs> so yeah, these are sand dabs. <laughs> sand dabs, there are two species that we come in contact with um, and they're very difficult to identify between the two. Um, but we have protocols and ways to, um, you know, see what species is which. Yeah. Yeah, you can see how they're pretty round, both of these. So these are two different species of sand dabs. Uh, they're both pretty round, uh, but this one kind of looks more like, uh, I like to think of it as like a pentagon. Um, they're a little more like kind of square, whereas this one's a little oblong. But in years where you find lots of these sand abs, sometimes it's really hard to tell the difference. Because when they get bigger, they start to show these kind of more identifying features. But when they're smaller, they generally kind of look the same. They're just round. <laughs> they're just round. And usually they're eroded, so you can't, so it's hard to tell if they're just eroded. And they, they should be oblong, but they kind of eroded in a way where they look like this. Um, yeah, it's just kind of hard to tell. But... Luckily, this year we've been finding mostly anchovy, so that means it's good. Veronica asked, are we guessing the number of single otoliths or pairs? We are guessing single. Single otoliths, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I guess we can... Yeah, is there any more? Good question. These are one last species. These are sculpin. They kind of look like rockfish, but they're generally thicker. Mm -hmm. yeah, they're pretty cool. Sometimes we'll find these, and then these also, like the sculpin species, um, they could have these, they call them uh, preopercular spines, and sometimes we'll find these spines in our samples. Um, we don't have any ready. Oh wait, actually. Yeah, those are really fun to find. Yeah, yeah so these would be from the sculpin. So there are these crazy looking bones that are actually in the face of the, the fish. Um, they're staghorn sculpin right there. But yeah, mm -hmm. so these two we can pair up and estimate how many uh, of these sculpin they ate. But yeah, we haven't found any this year, but yeah, they're pretty cool. Every now and then you'll see them. They're crazy. Should we show the beaks? Yeah. So now we're going to show, um, is it two spot? I think these might be, yeah. California two spot octopus beak. Yeah, so these are upper beaks. Let's see if there's a lower one. How many of you knew octopus had beaks? <laughs> yeah. It's kind of a fun fact. 
and squid. Yeah, I didn't know they looked like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, so these are going to be their lower beaks. Um, let's see. Huh. They're very finicky. <laughs> yeah, they like to jump too. Let's see. Oh my god. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, yeah. lower beak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so these like are interesting because they kind of look like little stars. So that's how I can tell their lower beaks, mm -hmm. um, that they're California two-spot octopus. Beaks don't like to cooperate. Yes, they you're right. Oh, jeez. Hurry back. Did you press finish? Mm -mm. Oh. Okay. Yeah, now we'll go to questions. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> okay. So that's what we look for yeah. and like we said we record all this data onto our data sheets um, and that can tell us uh, the size of fish or cephalopods uh, the birds have been eating that mm -hmm. day so yeah so now we're ready for questions yeah if you guys want to ask away any. yeah um Lishka says what sorts of trends have you seen from the data in terms of what fish are most important for seabird food and what conservation challenges or hope points are we seeing from the data? Yeah, I think Meredith. Um... Oh. <laughs> so Meredith said, um, the Farallon cormorants eat mostly rockfish, anchovy, and different types of flatfish. Sometime around 2008, anchovy dropped out of their diet and they had a sharp decline in their productivity. Um, around then too. Turns out anchovy are very important to cormorants. They have returned to the diet recently, uh, which is good. Yeah, so really studying the diet of these birds in this non-invasive way, we really see that relationship mm -hmm. between um, those fish populations and the success of these birds, which is really interesting, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think, oh, there's a lot of fish out in the water, um, like, why can't these birds just forage on anything? Like, there are certain fish that these birds like more because they know that it's highly nutritious and it'll support a good breeding season for them. Mm -hmm. um, but if those populations aren't there, they resort to, you know, sand dabs. Um, and we definitely see crashes um, in productivity rates, which I think is really interesting. Yeah. And... Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think this data might be compared to um, like net trawls of what fish are out there. Um, so it's kind of interesting to see like, you know, these fish or these birds are kind of like little samplers. We talked about that with the least terns last month, mm -hmm. but they are little samplers of what's available to them, what's most energy efficient for them to eat um, because they know they're the birds. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's kind of cool that we can look at that. Yeah. Uh, so Sherry says, what types of GI parasites do you see? Do cormorants have a species of tapeworms? Um, oh, Meredith said, good question. <laughs> we are not well versed yeah. in parasites, but we find nematodes and isopods, which are probably on the fish they consume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we didn't see any in this pellet, which is interesting. Surprising. Yeah, usually we find <laughs> them. They kind of look like... Um, <laughs> like bean sprouts yeah those? they're like kind of white tubular mm -hmm. things pretty long um, yeah but yeah we don't know species of yeah. parasites uh we just note it in mm -hmm. our notes that it was there but we don't count it or yeah. identify them mm -hmm. cormans are full of them <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah and then like i said uh, the isopods they they kind of look like big roly polies um mm -hmm. And like Meredith said, they're usually on the fish that they eat instead of inside the bird, yeah. which is good. So bycatch. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes we've gotten some crazy parasites in the um, the sea lion diet. Ooh. There's like some huge ones, and they look so scary. Yeah. <laughs> Mammals. Mammals. Gross. Parasites. Yeah. Birds rule. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so we should have all you guys guess how many, the, the biggest number of otoliths that were found in a single pellet was. Yeah. 
Yeah, I'm just slide. I don't think we showed the slide. Oh. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> oh my goodness. No. There's a lot of people here today, so maybe the Wi-Fi. Yeah. Drum roll. Yeah, so put in the comments how many you think and I didn't specifically find it, or we didn't yeah, find it. Yeah, it wasn't us. <laughs> but it's the record for the lab, so yeah. just think of that. So Alishka says 300. Veronica 500, says 500. 100. 100. Good guesses. It's a pretty wild number, so. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think the average is that we get? I'd say probably like. 30, mm -hmm. 20, 30 is probably like the average we'll find. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Angela says 80, and Marissa is going very specific with 112. <laughs> Good guess. Remember, this is all time record for the lab. Cherry says 250. <laughs> yeah, so drum roll. <laughs> it's not even sure. Oh, okay. Uh, it's 1,166 otoliths. And those are whole otoliths. <laughs> they're broken ones in there too. So you can imagine thousand. that is a lot of fish. That and must so, have taken all day. Yeah, probably <laughs> multiple days. Um, and these were sand dabs. Um, so just imagine this bird going up and down all day um, to foraging the floor. On yeah. So that's over 500 fish that this bird ate in a in, in a, a day, day. We're guessing. Yeah, because they're pellets. Yeah, it took oh, them where's those two point five two days. And a half days <laughs> Yeah, that, that is insane. And they're pretty small and fragile otoliths, so I can't even imagine <laughs> that. And all the partials, like... Yeah. That looks yeah. like Veronica was the closest. Yeah. Congrats. <laughs> Yay. Alright. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, as you guys know, this is a series. So, mm -hmm. our next live from the lab is gonna um, be focusing on Cassin's Auklet diet. This is a real big turn because yeah. they do not eat fish. They eat larval fish. Oh, they, they like some fish. <laughs> but they really like zooplankton. So krill. So krill, mycids, mm -hmm. amphipods, copepods, crab larvae. Yeah, so we're going to explore a very different type mm -hmm. of diet next, next month. Mm -hmm. So I think... Stay tuned uh, for yeah, that. Yeah, stay tuned for that. It should be exciting. Yeah, little ocean creatures. Yeah, <laughs> very cool. But remember, it's also bird barf, so they're mm -hmm. partially digested, which yeah. we'll discuss some of those challenges mm -hmm. when we do that live stream. But thank you all yeah. for tuning in. And then if you can, there's a donate link. Um, but yeah, we appreciate your support, and thank you for tuning in again. Yeah, and feel free to send this to your friends. Tell them yeah. about it. <laughs> If they want to see what fish ear bones look like, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure that is not a widely known fact. Mm -hmm. I didn't know about that for the longest time. Mm -hmm. So yeah, let them know what's <laughs> going on in the marine lab here at Point Blue. And yeah, tune in next time. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thanks for bearing yeah. with us with those technical difficulties. Yeah. <laughs> Glad we made it through. Yeah. And you guys are very engaged, mm -hmm. which we love. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. <laughs> Bye, Bye. everyone. <laughs>